Piotr Pietrzak, who is in charge of reporting the importance of the debate on the universality of human rights seen through the prism of the international community's reaction to the Syrian conflict. Piotr is a PhD student at the University of Sofia. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Professor Lafov, uh, Professor Zelaskova, thank you much for your invitation. Uh, today um, I want to talk about the universality of human rights in the context of Syrian conflict and Middle East. How uh, human rights could be applied to this well, geographical location. Um, basically, uh, let me just tell you something about myself. I've been uh, studying this conflict for the last I suppose eight years. I've been approaching this conflict from various perspectives, uh, predominantly from theory of international relations, but also philosophy. Uh, human rights is something which is constantly appearing in my research because, uh, as we all know, the human rights have not been uh, particularly valuable in this uh, part of the world. Human life doesn't much matter when the war is uh, on, and uh, that's a tragedy. Uh, but what are the human rights? Uh, basically, in order to explain human rights in basic terms, that's the, human, that's the rights which we all share simply because we are humans. These rights apply regardless of where we are, from where we come from, what we believe or what we choose to believe. It doesn't matter our background, this, this human rights should be applicable to every single human being on the planet. They are very comprehensive. It's not only human, uh, the rights which are basic. Human rights apply to all spheres of life, to the associations, assembly, education, to the press, information, speech, religion, the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is which was established in 1948, some 70 years ago, which brings me to the conclusion that Sofia University, which is 130 years, might be much older than human rights, isn't it? But it's not necessarily. Uh, there was Magna Carta, which was in 1215, uh, 800 years ago. So it is a long tradition, as we all know. It's not only 70 years of uh, tradition, which some people uh, try to try to uh, persuade us that it, the human human rights tradition is just 70 years old, and that's not necessarily the the case. Um, human rights, the Declaration of Human Rights, also uh, happened to be established after one of the worst humanitarian disasters in the in the human uh, history, uh, the Second World War. Uh, I'm Polish, and uh, the tragedy of, human, of Second World War, uh, which happened in Poland, is particularly um, difficult, considering what happened with the uh, Jews in my country, the genocide which happened, uh, and it is a good thing that we actually came to our senses and we established some sort of rules and regulations which uh, try to force and basic human rights on every single human being. It's just that it is a process which will have to be um, carried on in the future and we need to deliberate on, on uh, various of applications uh, of human rights. And that's the thing, universal, the concept of universality of human rights imply that everyone gets equal treatment, everyone gets, uh, as, is accountable to, to law, uh, the uh, human rights are universal and uh, it, there is a concept of equality which brings me to a um, suggestion that a world in which every person enjoys all of the human rights and enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and other international human rights uh, is, a, is something which we will have to achieve and we will have to uh, enforce in every single aspect, in every single corner of the world, in order for everyone to, to enjoy them fully. And that's a project which um, causes a lot of controversy. The controversy um, has to do with the fact that, well, how about if everyone has the same rights, so how about the, all of the people who are responsible for Holocaust? Do they share the same uh, human rights? How about uh, dictators? Do they, should they enjoy the same human rights? I suppose that there are 
and various interpretations, positive interpretations, suggest that yes, you have rights no matter where you are, where you come from, um, everyone is equal before law, uh, your humans are, uh, human rights are protected by law, no unfair detainment should apply to, to people who pursue human rights and uh, everyone has a right to trial, which is the basic thing which should apply to all human beings, 8 billion of them. But these folks, they, they killed all of these millions of people and should they get the same treatment? Should they get the same human rights which we do? I, I haven't killed anyone yet, I suppose, but uh, I don't think that these, these people should enjoy the same human rights like me. And the human rights is quite specific about that. And everyone should be accountable for what they action. So they should be punished for their actions. But how can we punish the war criminals for, for mistreating other people's human rights? The capital punishment is not applicable. So how on earth can we make sure that human rights apply to everyone if we cannot um, enforce human rights on people who actually violate them? So that's, that's a little bit of controversy. Um, the controversy is also extended to the fact that Western war, despite of our um, declarations, we very often uh, support various war criminals. Like for instance, Mrs. Thatcher uh, was so in favor of apartheid, and you know British people tend to present themselves as very, very particular about uh, protecting human rights, which is a little bit of uh, hypocrisy. Uh, the same uh, applies to Mr. Reagan, who was a very good friend of Pinochet. Um, well, I'm not going to go into uh, specifics of this, uh, I will leave you to it. Um, there is a Western complicity which we need to consider for sure. Um, the Western com complicity also extends to the East. We have uh, some presidents who violate their country's territorial integrity in order to achieve their goals which, uh, you know, it doesn't extend only to uh, Ukraine, Syria, it's also within their borders in Chechnya. Also, Syria. Syria is a very interesting case uh, study because, as you know, it's not only one civil war which is happening uh, at once. There is a couple of wars which happen. Uh, the outbreak of uh, civil war in 2011 was mainly between uh, Bashar al-Assad and, and Syrian rebels, but ever since it evolved into a, a proxy war between all of the countries who claim to be a protectors of human rights. Russia, United States, Britain, France and China, they've been all involved, despite of the fact that they claim that they, that they very much desire for, for the human rights to, to prosper. And Bashar al-Assad gets a lot of support from Russia, China, uh, in order to avoid humanitarian intervention in, in this country. And many people in the West tend to picture him as this that dictator who, you know, uh, is supported by Iran, Russia, China. And that's why um, all of these bad things are happening in Syria. Well, you know, how about these folks? Can you recognize this fellow? That was be be before 2011. All of the Western be be leaders who supported Bashar al-Assad be be before 2011, between 2000 and 2011, also contributed to this state of affairs which we are in at the moment. And uh, so not everything is as uh, smooth as Western media try to present. Um, so if we accuse Putin for um, propping up Bashar al-Assad, we also should uh, accuse Tony Blair, Mr. Sarkozy, um, British Queen or Mrs. Merkel or any other leader uh, of uh, complicity in this case. And that brings me to this man, Bashar al-Assad. He inherited uh, his uh, country from his father who also um, was not a great leader, but, but he was very successful leader here. He had very powerful friends. Uh, ever since 2011, um, despite how we look at, uh, at, the, at him, how we look at his 
conduct in, uh, in Syria, he has been violating human rights of his fellow citizens. And that's how he preserved his, his role. We can disagree about that. Yeah. Because uh, his actions caused uh, the departure of half a million of people and 12 million refugees and internally displaced. So here comes the idea of human rights. How can we protect human rights in such a circumstances? How United Nations can come together to um, enforce on the rulers like Bashar al-Assad, Gaddafi, Saddam Hussein, or any other um, person who, who has very strange um, understanding of, of the notion? How can we enforce human rights protection? Well, we elaborated a very interesting uh, procedure. Uh, there is a, a United Nations Security Council, which is composed of France, Britain, uh, China, United States and Russia. And uh, they basically decide, shall we intervene or shall we not intervene? Shall we do something about it or not? And uh, the very interesting thing is that we need an anonymity. So everyone has to agree in order for international community to do something. Which, which means that these people, Bashar al-Assad, should be warned. They should face the dilemma. Shall I, after what I did, shall I, shall I actually escape? Or shall I find the other way to, to protect my, uh, well, life? Because, let's be honest, what's happened to Gaddafi, what's happened to Saddam Hussein, was a reaction of individuals, of the citizens of, of this country or any other country to, to the abuse which they got from their president. So, how, how, but the, the, that's, that's the thing, there are, there are interests and uh, France, Britain, USA might have totally different uh, um, interests than Russia and China and that's what makes the whole process uh, irrelevant. Because, it's simply irrelevant because we cannot do anything as an international community to enforce human rights on every single human being on the planet because there is so many different interests. And, and, you know, we can deliberate for years, for, for decades, because that's what we've been doing, how to improve this system. But with, without establishing the common ground on how we will go through certain difficult decisions, we will just stay idle and do nothing. And the civil wars in countries like Syria will finish or will go on. And the very fact that uh, Syrian conflict is heading to its end, um, it didn't end or it's not gonna end as we expected. We expected that Bashar al-Assad will pack his bags and he will just flee uh, like Ukrainian president did with after after annexation of Crimea or before annexation of Crimea actually, or we expected that uh, he would end up as, like Saddam Hussein or or Gaddafi, and that was in 2013-2014. He even poisoned his citizens, but nothing like that happened because he has strong friends. He has strong friends who protect his interests. So the question arises: How the international community can bypass the UN Security Council, which is not which is not responsive now. Despite of the fact how we interpret Syrian conflict, whether we are pro-Bashar uh, al-Assad or pro-rebels -re or pro-I don't know, ISIS, but just a, just a, just a figure of speech, uh, there is, from my perspective, as someone who is very much into, into protecting uh, human rights, what matters is the little man, civilian, I don't care about the interests of, of politicians who basically uh, start wars or start conflicts in order to achieve their, their interests. The UN Security Council doesn't work. It doesn't work full stop. We need to reform it or we need to make it work. And by making it work, uh, you know, the, we've been trying to do that for 70 years. It, it didn't happen because people have different interests. For instance, in uh, the votes uh, in uh, 2012, uh, on the 4th of February, uh, there was a UN declaration which suggested that, oh, let's do something about Syria. But, uh, well, it was outvoted by uh, Russia and by, by China, who said no to, to this. 
I'm saying it doesn't, that's just a particular case, a case example. When Russia uh, puts forward a, a UN uh, security um, um, declaration which, which says something, oh, let's do something with, with Israel and Palestine, uh, United States say, says no. So, so uh, there, there are all these interests which are um, contradicting. And, you know, in my country, in Poland, we say you need to be a friend of the rabbit. And the rabbit is always a very influential guy. So if you're a friend of the rabbit, you can get away with everything. And for instance, Saudi Arabia, um, you know, they present themselves as a very, uh, a very responsible international player, but what they do in Yemen, in Syria, it's quite appalling. But uh, again, they are friends of uh, USA, so even if they behave like ISIS, they get away with that. And that's, that's the paradox which I'm talking about. And that applies to, to every single sphere of life. And I want to quickly talk about the notion of um, protection of independence and sovereignty. Uh, in 1965, the United Nations General Assembly adopted the Declaration of Inadmissibility of Intervention in Domestic Affairs of States and the Protection of Independence and Sovereignty. And this is uh, contradictory to the protection of human rights. It protects the integrity of the states, but it doesn't protect the human, human rights. And we have, we have a little bit of conflict here. Not a little bit, a lot of conflict. And um, we're not helping ourselves by introducing all of the laws which don't work. Like for instance, responsibility to protect in 2008-2009. And that was a rule which was implemented in order to overcome this contradiction. And what it did? Well, um, Basing on this responsibility to protect, uh, Western countries send the intervention to Libya. And um, this fellow, Gaddafi, didn't get the process <coughs> which he deserved. He should be, I don't know, in Hague, like uh, um, Milosevic. The situation is quite complicated. Uh, we end up, ended up with a massive challenge, especially back in 2014, 2015. Ever since Russia intervened in Syria, uh, everything was cleared out. Uh, Russia basically uh, sorted out all of the enemies of, of uh, Assad and, you know, humanitarian intervention is no longer applicable. The, the concept of humanitarian intervention uh, is no longer um, applicable. But there was a situation in 2013 when, in Edgota when Bashar al-Assad was accused of uh, basically violating human rights uh, by bombing with chemical weapons, his own citizens. But the um, US at the last moment said, no, no, we will not do anything. Let them just uh, resolve their problems. The only good thing which actually happened was that uh, for a year ever since 2013 to 2004, most of the chemical weapons were taken away from Bashar al-Assad, which is great because uh, even, even if uh, rebels would have won war back then, they wouldn't have the, these uh, chemical weapons which basically would jeopardize the entire world and, and, or the region. Um, so that brings me to the, to the suggestion that uh, if you have good friends who are powerful, you can sleep tight. You don't need to worry about you know, people who, uh, who would, I don't know, outlaws you from power or try to kill you or uh, bring, to, bring you to justice. But sure, some can just sleep like like a baby. Um, 511,000 casualties, which is half a million, 12 million refugees and international displaced. That's, that's what's balance of the uh, Syrian war, which, like I mentioned before, it's a proxy war. It's not only a war between um, Bashar al-Assad and the rebels. It's more complicated. We all know that. I have like 10 minutes or five. So let's focus on something which I want to talk about. Sphere of um, interest and, and friends is not only Bashar al-Assad who has friends. Um, the uh, rebels they are supported by Turkey, by uh, Jordan, and some rebels are even supported by Iran. But most most mostly uh, that's a, a confrontation between Russia and the USA, Iran and Saudi Arabia. They have interest to destabilize this country, or they have interest to replace Bashar al-Assad with their fault, their their guy. And that's not how it's supposed to be. These superpowers, or regional powers, 
they are definition of violators of human rights. Simply because they think that they, they have a right to go there and pursue their rights. Just let them fight or let them resolve their own problems without sending weapons. I mean, sending humanitarian, humanitarian help is a great idea, but uh, that also um, contributes to extending this, this problem. That's a huge paradox. And the huge paradox of the Syrian conflict uh, is the fact that there is a lot of blo blood which spilled unnecessarily. It could have ended in 2012, 2013, if all of these Western, Eastern, and uh, Arabic countries didn't intervene by helping, helping the Syrian rebels. Well, they didn't help. Well, the, they actually made it more, worse. Um, back in 2012, 2013, uh, you would see a lot of uh, caricatures like that on Western uh, media. Uh, suggesting that the end of Bashar al-Assad is, is near, and that he would end up like Saddam Hussein. But then, um, you know, um, USA and Russia decided that, oh, well, let's, let's just turn Syria into our own, own proxy war. Who cares about human rights? Let's just, let's just do what we did during the Cold War. So, um, Syria is very complex matter in a way. You cannot just, I'm just making it a little bit like too trivial, but it's inhabited by I don't know how many minorities, but it has been kept in balance for, for some time. And, and that's the paradox because when there is like such a pluralized and diversity, it's, it's, it's very difficult to protect the person's human rights because it's so difficult. People have different interests even within the country. And, and, uh, you know, who created, who uh, drawn this uh, border? It was in 1916, Sykes and Pike, the French guy and the British guy who met together and said, okay, let's settle that. Okay, that's how Syria will look like, that's how Iraq will look like. And so, well, ever since, we have seen a number of atrocity happening. This problem uh, goes back to basically last century, the beginning of the last century. And I, I, I will quickly, quickly touch on, on the complexity of, of the conflict. And like I mentioned before, it's not only Assad and Free Syrian Army. Ever since 2012, the conflict evolved into, into the war within the war between Al Nusra, Islamic State, Islamic Front, National Coalition for Syrian Revolutionary and Opposition Forces. Ever since it got complicated, uh, we got Islamic State, uh, which uh, intervened uh, or transferred its influence from Iraq. Um, I think they, they, they are quite bad in terms of human rights protection, for sure. Uh, the same uh, happening with Al Nusra, is supported by some Western countries and Saudi Arabia, but they very much uh, have human rights concept in. Um, they, they don't care about it too much. Uh, and, uh, you know, killing in civilians is, has been on a um, daily basis happening in, in Syria. Al-Qaeda intervened in Syria because it has been destabilized by, by the West and the East. So ever since, we will ask ourselves, oh, why, why these uh, radicals intervened in Syria? Simply because of intervention of Western and, and uh, Eastern uh, countries. And that's uh, basically uh, brings me to the vicious circle uh, suggestion that it, it will continue like that if we we'll allow it. If we allow all of this Russia, USA, Britain, France, or China, actually China is, stays away, but if we allow them to, uh, well, speak from the position of authority, to tell us off, oh, you don't protect human rights. You don't protect human rights in Bulgaria, in Poland, in Europe, wherever. And they do this on a daily basis in, in, uh, in human rights. They have no right to, to talk to, uh, to us like that, basically, and to do whatever, whatever it takes to establish their human rights. That, that, that's how we, the matrix of the internal relations in Syria looks like. In order to, I've created it some time ago, I've tried to make it easier for me to, uh, to uh, move this debate forward, but it, I, it actually got more complicated. I, I cannot read this, this uh, slide anymore. Uh, I'm constantly adding something or, or taking away, but 
you know, it got, maybe this slide explains it better. What's happening in Syria, what was happening in Syria in 2015 was basically all of the isms which, which intervened in Syria and tried to transfer it to its, its, its liking. And um, that extends to, to the global, radical, well, axis of evil. Because what's happening in Syria happens in, on the borderland between uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan, in Yemen, in uh, S uh, Somalia, in Nigeria with Boko Haram, uh, also Mali, Niger, uh, borderland, Libya, ever since 2011, it got so destabilized that we have three or four civil wars which are happening at once. Uh, and again, that brings us to the uh, genesis of this conflict, of the Western and Eastern intervention. Without it, it would be all over. So, some, some scholars suggested that there's arch of instability in this, in this region of the world, created by our interpretation of, of the uh, events. Also, what I want to um, communicate today is that very often Western countries say that all oh, rebels are solution for, uh, to, to the problem. And unfortunately, they've been all committed war, committed war crimes. It's not only ISIS or, or Al-Nusra or Al-Qaeda. First Syrian army also was responsible for its share of uh, human suffering. That's happened in, uh, in Congo or uh, South Sudan as well. And, you know, there is not good and bad guys. They're all bad. And they are all bad, which affects the civilians in, in Syria. Even those guys who are um, moderate, they cannot uh, basically uh, do anything about it. They cannot stop them because they are out of their, their, uh, their hands. Uh, well, I want to talk about anticipatory collective self-defense action, which, which, which uh, the concept which was created in 1999 uh, with the intervention in uh, former Yugoslavia. The international community came together and they decided, okay, well, let's, let's overcome this impasse and let's, let's intervene. That was one solution to the problem, but even, even if we supply that, that wouldn't, that wouldn't work in this, this case, because people there in Syria or Iraq, they don't have this uh, understanding that, uh, you know, peace, stability, it's not only something which they inherit or they get from, from outside. They need to work towards it. And human rights is very important in this aspect because uh, a Syrian uh, civil war is slowly but surely heading to its inevitable conclusion. The moderates and jihadist rebels have lost. Uh, Syria... Um, is, there is a dilemma whether this Syria is prepared for such an outcome that Bashar al-Assad is in, in, in power uh, and he will remain uh, in power. The question is how the human rights will apply now. Without this crucial sentence in my presentation, there is no freedom without responsibility. And there is no responsibility without, uh, without uh, protecting human rights. Uh, the human life cannot be protected in the state of constant war. Benum omna omni. We cannot protect human rights in the state of constant war. That's why the preservation of freedom and peace should be a common objective of all people. Not only people in Syria, not only people in Iraq, but everyone. We should say something against this. Western, Eastern, Arabic interventions in... And saying is not enough, for sure, but we cannot tolerate that. In order to avoid conflict, we need to engage in that. And we need to engage from, from outside. Um, and uh, diplomacy is important. And thank you much for your time. I just tried to skip through your slides. Thank you. And I'm sorry for being too long. No time left for questions. And maybe during the coffee break, it was impressive report. And <coughs>